Well, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, one or two people are here for the first time, so that's really nice to, to welcome you. So the regulars we know um, once a month on a Wednesday afternoon, we have a, a lecture, and often it's from some from within the staff team or someone linked to CMJ. Occasionally it's a guest from outside, and uh, we have a series of, of really good teaching sessions, and um, again, it's great to see you. Please feel free to come along next month which will be our final one of 2019. So next month we have Neil Osborne, and he'll be speaking about manna and its significance. Um, so that's going to be really good. On the 13th of November, we start at 2 o'clock with refreshments and the lecture at 2.15, and we try and finish with um, the lecture about 3 o'clock, a little bit of time for Q&A, and then you want to stay around. Uh, there are lots of free literature here to take if you want to buy a book for Christmas. And why wouldn't you? That would be really, really lovely before you went. So today we have um, Fran Wadhams, who is going to be speaking uh, to us. Hey. We, we welcome Fran, but she needs no real welcome because she's uh, a regular volunteer here and does some really helpful volunteering work for the UK, uh, for CMJ UK. Um, but wider than that, she's had uh, a very important advocacy role for Israel o over many years, and some of you might know her from that context, as well as her work here as volunteering with CMJ UK. And she's going to be speaking today about an advocacy event uh, rooted in CMJ's history, which also has some important applications for us today. So um, will you please welcome Fran, and I invite her to come and speak to us this afternoon. Thank you very much. More of that, more of that. Okay, um, I am going to be using notes fairly extensively because I am going to be quoting from some historical documents. Um, <laughs> okay. So. I got into um, advocacy about 15 years ago, um, and it was uh, through just learning, uh, learning a bit more about um, the truth, really. Okay. No, you. Oh, you want me to speak? A, dear, I don't know. You would never think I've been teaching for years, would you? So... So, uh, it's about 15 years ago, and the way that I came into it was not so much from a, a theological perspective, but just because it felt like the right thing to do. Um, I was aware of the calumnies that were being spread about Israel. Um, they seemed to me to be very wrong, very unjust, and that was how I got into it. I've written, as you know, a series of articles for CMJ, which have gone out in the quarterly reviews. Um, and I had the very great honour of being invited to give a staff lecture for a society that's had the welfare of Jewish people at its heart for over 200 years. In the process of writing this, I had to think about what I would, what I would take as a subject. And... I wanted to make it very relevant to CMJ um, and to CMJ's interest that they've shown, that they've shown certainly um, recently um, in the advocacy for Jewish people. I suspected that there was far more to advocacy in CMJ than met the eye, and I was delighted when some research um, on <clears throat> Wikipedia, <clears throat> sorry about that, um, in Wikipedia resulted in my going on to the page about Christian Zionism in the UK. It mentioned somebody from the um, London uh, Society for the Promotion of Christianity amongst the Jewish people, which I knew was the forerunner of CMJ, and it said this man had an important role in exposing the blood libel involved in the Damascus affair in 1840. Once I investigated that link, I discovered that it was about advocacy. The advocacy for Jewish people, the first example of international advocacy that I know about, at any rate, the resurgence of the blood libel, and it 
answered for me the question, should Christians, should people from CMJ be interested in involving themselves in advocacy? So, ladies and gentlemen, I give you the Damascus Affair of 1840. Now, whilst um, I am hoping that, I, because of the screen, it's hard for me to see. There we go. Whilst this is coming up on the screen, this is going to be a short video which will outline the Damascus Affair from the point of view of Jewish scholars. But before I say this, I want to dedicate um, this particular lecture to those people who are here and who are not here who are from this area who've decided to engage in advocacy not only for Israel but also for the Jewish people in the UK. I know there are some people here and this is dedicated to them. This video will give you an overview of what the Damascus affair was about and I think it'll It'll help later because I've got to bring in all kinds of people and names and geography. So, the Damascus Affair, the resurgence of the blood libel in modern times. Anti-Semitism is almost always a current event. It reflects and often magnifies the fears and anxieties of the times. The blood libel is no exception. In 1983, Mustafa Tlaas, serious defense minister, wrote a book in which he claimed that the Jews of Damascus committed ritual murder in 1840. In his introduction, he wondered how such terrible crime could have happened in a place like Damascus. His conclusion? The Jews isolated themselves so as to surround themselves with mystery, so the Muslim world knew almost nothing about them. Thus, it is not surprising that Damascus was shocked by this loathsome crime. However, it rapidly overcame its ignorance about the Jews, and now every mother warns her son, be careful not to stray far from home, lest the Jew comes, puts you in a sack, takes you, and slaughters you, and drains your blood in order to prepare the matzah of Zion. Generation after generation passed on this message of the treachery of the Jews. What really happened in Damascus in 1840 reveals how an ancient lie is used in power politics, then and now. On the evening of February 5th, 1840, a monk known as Father Thomas and his servant disappeared without a trace in Damascus, Syria, then a part of the Ottoman Empire. Neither man was ever seen again. Within days, Thomas's fellow monks spread the rumor that the Jews had murdered him for his blood. This was not the first time Christians in the Ottoman Empire made such an accusation. There were other similar charges in other cities in the early 1800s. But in every case, the authorities dismissed the accusation as false. This time, they took the matter very seriously. Why? The new charge came at a time when the Ottoman Empire was beginning to crumble. In 1831, Muhammad Ali, the Viceroy of Egypt, took advantage of that weakness to force the Ottomans out of Syria and name his son Governor General. Many European nations saw the struggle for power within the empire as an opportunity to expand their influence in the region by supporting one side or the other. France supported Muhammad Ali. Therefore, France's main rivals, Britain and Austria, backed the Ottomans. To complicate matters, some people in Damascus and other cities in the Ottoman Empire were under the protection of a European nation. Among them was Father Thomas, who, like other Christian missionaries in the empire, had French protection. That is why the French consul led the investigation into Father Thomas's disappearance and oversaw the interrogation of one Jew after another. When the Jews refused to confess, the French turned them over to the Syrians, who tortured the Jews until they finally told authorities what they wanted to hear. The French council claimed that he had at first doubted that Jews employ human blood in the celebration of their religious mysteries. But the mounting evidence overcame his doubts. That mounting evidence consisted mainly of a few forced confessions. There's no record that any Christian or Muslim in Syria challenged the idea that Jews commit ritual murder until the French consul targeted a Jewish merchant under Austria's protection. The Austrian consul immediately insisted that the merchant's rights be protected. He refused to allow that Jew to be tortured. 
The stand taken by the Austrian consul placed Syria in a bind. The only way to get the confessions that the French were demanding was through torture. But to do so in defiance of Austria could be dangerous to Syria's governor general and his father, Muhammad Ali. It was now clear that the fate of the Jews would not be decided in Syria. People in Europe and America knew nothing about events in Damascus until March, when the first letters from Syria reached the West. Many of these letters came from frantic Jews. Others were written by diplomats, businessmen, missionaries, and travelers. After reading them, one Paris newspaper noted, rightly or wrongly, the Jews have a terrifying and inconceivable reputation of sacrificing a Christian on their Passover and distributing the blood to their co-religionists in the region. Such comments outraged European Jews who wrote indignant letters to the editors. Some even persuaded newspapers to print the Haggadah, the book read in Jewish homes on Passover, to prove that Judaism does not require ritual murder. Gradually, these efforts altered the conversation. A number of prominent Jews also met privately with government officials to secure justice for the Jews of Damascus. They found the British and the Austrian governments eager to help, mainly because they saw that affair as an opportunity to embarrass Egypt and France. The French government, however, stood firm in its support for its consul in Damascus and Muhammad Ali. By the summer of 1840, the Middle East was on the verge of a war. The Ottoman Empire and its European allies had given Muhammad Ali an ultimatum. Give up Syria in 30 days, or we will attack. To show they were serious, the British sank a number of Egyptian supply ships in the Mediterranean. Two days later, Muhammad Ali gave up his claim to Syria. He also decided to free Jews held as prisoners in Damascus. Jews around the world rejoiced. Their efforts, however, did not end the blood libel. It continued well into the 20th century. But their efforts did show what Jews could accomplish if they had the will to do so. Never before had so many Jews in so many places worked together to alter public opinion. Many Jews also took pride in the fact that a large number of Christians supported the Jews of Damascus. Christians who believed the Jews of Damascus were guilty had a different view of the Damascus affair. They saw the outcome as proof of Jewish power and evidence of a Jewish conspiracy. On the other hand, Muslims in the Middle East in the 1840s saw the Damascus affair as a footnote to the larger story of European imperialism. The affair itself illustrates not only the power of a lie, but also why this hatred is so easily manipulated. As Mark Twain once observed, the truth is not hard to tell, but a lie well told lives forever. So the rest of this talk is going to be drawing out some of the points which have been made in that film about the Damascus affair. There were some hints in what in the the uh, script that was made there, but that was told very much told very much understandably from a Jewish point of view. And there are some things that I think people in this room are going to be very interested to learn about the Damascus affair. So some of the key words here are blood libel. So blood libel is the ancient lie that was referred to here, and very sadly, it began in England. Here are two famous examples of blood libel in England, which most of you will be very well aware of. Um, the Little Sir William of Norwich and the story of Little St Hugh, um, which is commemorated with his shrine in Lincoln Cathedral, which is still an open sore, I may say, amongst many Jewish people within the UK Jewish community. It's re recognised today that the story that was cooked up at the time was um, a lie. It's, that's recognised today, but it wasn't recognised for very many years. And the fact that this shrine to this child who died around... Easter time in the 13th century um, was put in there as a memorial to the blood libel against the Jews is still very shocking. In short, the accusation was that 
these two children who disappeared um, in different years, in different parts of the country, but about the same time of year, had been taken by Jews, slaughtered, and their blood used to make the matzah bread for Passover. This is why it's called the blood libel. It was totally untrue and it was used against Jews for many years until, as most people will know in here, 1290 when Edward I issued an edict expelling the Jews entirely from England. And we know that they were not permitted to return until the days of Oliver Cromwell. So it was about 400, nearly 400 years Jews officially were not supposed to be in England. And this here is a, a contemporary manuscript showing the expulsion of the Jews in 1290. The pogroms that ensued from these blood libels were horrific, and I don't need to go into them. We can think of the pogrom at York and at Lincoln in particular, where Jews were rounded up, um, placed into buildings, and sometimes burned to death, sometimes simply slaughtered in the streets. The blood libel is a vicious lie, and that it is still around today, as we shall see, is, is an absolute disgrace. Now, from that, we're just going to fast forward to the 19th century when we're talking about, and as they mentioned in the video there, the Ottoman Empire was now, in 1840, beginning to fray around the edges. Um, the dark, the sort of orangey-brown areas on that map show you the places that would disappear during the period that we're talking about. You can see in the top corner that Austria-Hungary is taking back control over various areas which are now in places like Romania and Moldova. And the next places to fall, as you can see, are going to be places like Egypt and the Eastern Mediterranean, Syria, the Eastern Mediterranean. And where there's a power vacuum, you're shortly going to, very shortly going to get other forces which take that vacuum away. They're going to be filled. And at this time, it was going to be um, Britain and France and then Austria-Hungary who were going to try to fill it. So those are the players, because it's against, the, against a, a time of huge international turmoil that this is going on. Could I request, um, sorry, could I request a window to be opened or something? Because with the sun coming in, it's, for me, getting absolutely sweltering hot. <laughs> okay. So at this time, as everybody will know, Jews are returning to Jerusalem. Um, the city of Jerusalem in the 1840s and 50s, the old city of Jerusalem, is becoming mainly Jewish. It's going to be a majority Jewish, uh, Jewish area very soon. It was a very poor community. It was a very needy community. But it wasn't the only community in the Middle East. At, as you can see here, this is the time when the London Society for the Promotion of Christianity Amongst the Jews was beginning its Holy Land ministry. Here's a familiar place. I've never been there myself, but I would really like to go at some stage. It's in the 1830s that the London Society, as I'm going to call it, sent their first missionaries to... Jerusalem, and in 1837, a clinic was opened, a much-needed clinic was opened, particularly for the poor people of Jerusalem. Um, the people who were sent over were um, Dr. Albert Jessman um, and Melville Bergheim, who was a, far who was a pharmacist. Um, and they began that clinic, which began partly in the old city of Jerusalem. Um, here is the mission hospital that was built, which, of course, is now the Anglican School. That, that mission hospital was built 60 years after the beginning of the clinic um, in 1897. 
Um, but there was somebody else who went over as well. And this man was somebody who was interested in mission rather than, uh, rather than the medical side. And I was hearing people at the, uh, dinner t the lunch table discussing who could get into the Middle East and who couldn't, who could get into Jerusalem. And th this was the Reverend G. W. Peretz, who arrived in Jerusalem with the London Society group in 1837. So we're now set up, bustling place. Here's our introduction then to the Damascus affair. Here's what it did. It precipitated the first international advocacy for Jewish people of the sort that we recognize today. The Damascus affair revived anti-Semitism in France via the blood libel. In Europe, you understand, the blood libel and, that the, and religious anti-Semitism was still there, but it had rather gone underground. It was beginning to take on sociological aspects because of the Enlightenment, because of interest in science. So the reduction of the influence of religion with opinion formers at that time meant that the anti-Semitism was beginning to morph in other ways. But this event revived the blood libel in France. Another result was that as a, res as a result of the Damascus affair and the persecution in it, the need to defend Jews resulted in international cooperation between Jewish organisations and Christians were also stirred to advocate for the Jewish communities and they referred to them as Israel and at the forefront of the Christian organisations was CMJ in its London society form. So, 19th century Damascus. Here's a, a view over 19th century Damascus. I mentioned that there were other communities of Jews within, within the Levant and within all across North Africa. And Damascus had one of the richest of those in every sense of the word. There were about 4,000 Jews in Damascus at the time, um, some of the families very well off. There was also a thriving Christian community. Remember that the, the, the Jewish and the Christian communities were centuries old. The Christian community, of course, was there from the day of Pentecost. Paul found them when he went there only a few years after the resurrection events. And the Jewish community, of course, had been there since earliest times, for many, many hundreds of years before Christ. The, Jew, the Christian community was largely under French protection, but the Jews were under the Austrian protection. The leader of, the, of Damascus, the Pasha, was Pasha um, Sharif, and he was the adopted son of Mehmet Ali, who was the viceroy of Egypt. And you'll remember from the film that um, Mehmet Ali was already challenging the Ottoman Empire within Egypt, uh, the, the power of the, the Ottoman Empire, and he was doing it in Damascus as well. The Jewish community was actually quite a rich community here. It was rich in money terms, it was rich in business, it was rich in property, and it was rich in learning. Some of the finest of the ancient documents, the ancient copies of the Talmud, the ancient copies of the Jewish scriptures, were to be found um, at the Jobar Synagogue. The Jobar Synagogue is still, or was still, one of the most famous of the synagogues in um, Damascus. It was the most ancient. Um, it's saying there, the shrine and synagogue of prophet Eliyahu Hanavi, which is Elijah the prophet, and it's actually there since 720, what they said was since 720 BC. Now, whether or not that is entirely accurate, this, this synagogue and this Jewish community had existed hundreds of years before Jesus was born. So we've got the centre of Jewish learning, we've got a really quite a prosperous and powerful Jewish community in Damascus. 
And then come the events of the 5th of February in 1840, when Father Thomas and his servant Amara, who, who were pictured there, disappeared. They were later um, said to have been found in the ditches and the drains, or the remains of their bodies had been said to be found in the ditches and the drains of Damascus. The last known reports of them being seen were in the company of a merchant, a Muslim merchant in the area, with whom they were having, apparently, Father Thomas was having a significant heated discussion. Um, but when the question came, what has happened to these people? Father Thomas's monks, his fellow monks in his community, as they said, immediately they blamed the Jewish community. They revived the old blood libel. Fifth, February the 5th seems a bit early for a Passover ritual, but they revived this blood libel and they immediately claimed that this was what had happened to Father Thomas. He had been taken and he had been um, uh, murdered in order to give blood for the Passover matzahs. A Jewish barber was arrested for this and subsequently when he refused to confess other people were then arrested as well and they were terribly tortured. The use of the bastinado which is essentially just beating people um, especially on the soles of the feet were used and more and more people became arrested and indeed at one stage there were 63 children who were arrested in order to try to put pressure on their parents because they were not telling the stories that the, um, that, that the uh, Pasha, Pasha Sharif wanted to hear. Very sadly, the French consul, who was Le Comte de Gratimontant, was encouraging, he was friends with Pasha Sharif, and he was encouraging this story and actually sending back reports to France about the blood libel. Reports appeared in the Paris papers. This, be this was becoming an international incident. But at the same time, Jews were also writing to people elsewhere in the empire, and they were going to have sympathetic ears in both the Austrian-Hungarian empire and in Britain, at least partly because those countries were looking for a foothold and a reason to be able to establish more of a foothold and more of a stronghold in that part of the area, of that part of the world as the Ottoman Empire collapsed. Now, within Damascus itself, we had a British consul, um, a man called Nathaniel Werry, and his grave is shown here. It's in Izmir, in what is today Turkey. Um, and uh, he, unfortunately, very much took the view that it probably was a blood libel. But on the other hand, you had the Austro-Hungarian consul, who was called Shivani Melato, and he became involved when one of the Jews, who was a powerful and rich merchant, who went, and was under the protection of the Austrian consulate, he um, was able then to intervene. And um, I just want to, to read a couple of the um, things that were said about these people, but by these people. Um, so, for example, uh, here's what Werry, Nathaniel Werry said, um, and he writes to Lord Ponsonby, who's the British ambassador in Constantinople, the head of the, uh, the capital of the Ottoman Empire. He says, I now proceed to communicate um, your, to your lordship what further information I've obtained. It has been immemorially the received opinion and belief of the Christian population throughout Turkey, and several instances have been brought to light by local governments in different parts, that the Jews scattered throughout the country immolated clandestinely Christians to obtain their blood to celebrate their feasts there within their religious ceremonies, and this fact has been proved here. Well, of course, by this time, what had happened was that the poor barber who'd been arrested, who was, I'm afraid, tortured to death, had confessed in the end 
to, well, to say he'd said what they had wanted to hear. And disgracefully, Werry went along with it. Um, on the other hand, Merlato, who was the Austrian consul, um, said the Austrian consul, who had hitherto watched the proceedings with ever-increasing disgust and reprobation, had an opportunity to intervene. He demanded the immediate release of the Jewish merchant, and this course the French consul opposed to the utmost, but the Austrian demand could not be refused, and um, Picciotto, who was the name of the uh, Jewish merchant, was actually released at that point. But nevertheless, there were still dozens of Jewish people who were in jail in Damascus and being tortured. Now, the newspapers got hold of it. Um, here we have something from the Times, which I'm going to come back to because of the contents absolutely at the top. The French newspapers reported the confessions in the Damascus affair, but they didn't mention <coughs> that they were obtained and extracted under torture. Fake news, anybody? Plus ça change, eh? The Times, unfortunately, also, before they heard, well, they were acting on this kind of dispatches that were coming back from Nathaniel Werry, and they too were claiming that there was, um, there may be a case to answer. But, enter CMJ, um, in the form of the London Society. Do you remember that I mentioned the Reverend G. W. Yes. Pirits, George Wilden Pirits? Um, he was born in 1809 in Prussia, what was then Prussia, which I think is sort of North Germany, Poland, Poland sort of border. He was a scholar and became a rabbi at the age of 18. He was exposed to the gospel, possibly from, I, I don't know if this is somebody who worked for the London Society, um, a man called Neander. Um, he was pro may have been in Holland at the time, um, he, but he was converted and baptised in 1834, and he was sent with that mission, that medical mission, to the Holy Land by the London Society in 1837. They were, this particular, um, this particular uh, slide shows the introduction to the report that he wrote on what he found when he was sent to Damascus in 1840. And it starts off there, the bit that I've um, circled, which you perhaps can't read, is an appeal m was made by the Jews themselves, this is the Jews of Jerusalem, to the members of the Christian mission at Jerusalem, established by the London Society for Promoting Christianity Amongst the Jews, and it was resolved that Mr. Pirates should proceed to Damascus, which he did in March of, 18, uh, of 1840. And he went there specifically to investigate, to find out what was actually going on there. So we now have CMJ exerting itself to advocate and to, to um, intercede on behalf of Jewish people, to find out what the truth of it is and to make it known. And so, he, so um, George Pirits is sent to Damascus to investigate and report, and this is the published version of the, re the extensive report which you can get you can find on the internet, um, although I very much suspect that CMJ has got some printed copies in their archives somewhere <coughs> of this. The persecution of the Jews at Damascus. And um, I want to um, read a, just a little bit about that. So... His report, his conclusion of his report at the end, which was printed here, was, I found the whole charge against the Jews there a vile fabrication. 
and that all means and right of legal defence was denied to them, whilst the most cruel tortures were exploited to extort from them false confessions of guilt. Once Pirates had finished, which was in, I think, late April in 1840, he went from Damascus to Alexandria, and he presented a petition to Mehmet Ali, the Pasha there, the Viceroy, Ottoman Viceroy, to whom he was presented by the British Consul General, appearing, um, but uh, being presented by the uh, Consul General and got a very sympathetic hearing from Mehmet Ali. You can imagine that um, Werry was not amused. Werry himself was personally mentioned, and uh, he says, I find my friend, he apparently put it in italics, the missionary for the conversion of the Jews at Jerusalem, not content with giving me a bad character at Beirut, as having taken an active part against the accused Jews for the murder of Padre Tommaso and his servant, and entertaining illiberal and uncharitable sentiments against the Jew nation, has been to Alexandria and made such strong allusions on my conduct towards Colonel Hodges that he required Mr. Pirritz to put them in tangible shape. I, Pirritz was asked to write about him. Um, it goes on in that sort of vein. Wherey, you will um, perhaps not be too sorry to hear, was not believed in London. And indeed, Lord Palmerston and the London diplomats um, said, uh, commented and wrote that he was far too ready to believe horrible stories, far too ready to believe the, the, um, the French version of events, far too ready to believe the worst of Jewish people, and far too bloodthirsty in his support of the torture that had been used to extract the confessions. So, three cheers for um, the Foreign Office for once. So, this particular, <laughs> so this particular, this particular report, which um, I have to say, I couldn't carry on reading in the end because he was so graphic in describing the sort of tortures that were inflicted on the people in order to get them to talk. It was tr it was really horrible. Um, this particular report was published in the Times. And in the end, it was actually printed as a booklet by Sir David Solomons, who was the first Jewish mayor of London. Um, even though Sir David Solomons, being aware of the nature of the, of, of the society um, and clearly not very happy about um, missionary activity going on amongst Jews, nevertheless, he was so impressed by the work that Pirates had done that he was prepared to publish this. And you can get copies of this. Um, it's, it's hard to get them, but you can get them. So, in... Um, oh, I'll just flip back a moment to this one. Um, you can't really see it, but right at the top here, it says... This is from the Times. We have already published the narrative of Mr Pirates, which is one of the most cogent justificatory pieces we have seen connected with the... Um, accusations brought against the Jews. So in the Times, the work of this man from CMJ, the advocacy work, got mentioned in there. Um, in May 1840, Pirates presented the petition that I've just mentioned to Mehmet Ali in Alexandria and uh, in the presence of the British consul, at any rate, Mehmet Ali um, was very positive about it, and he fe felt that he had done well in um, his presentation, but nothing at that stage was done. Now, in the meantime, CMJ members had put together a deputation which went to Lord Palmerston, um, uh, and it included Lord Shaftesbury, and it went on the 28th of May in 1840 about caring for the persecuted Jews. And again, please excuse my rifling through my papers. A deputation consisting of Lord Ashley, the Bishop of Ripon, Ripon Sir Thomas Baring, the banker Sir George Rose, the Member of Parliament and Diplomat and others waited on, on Lord Palmerston on the 28th of May. They presented a memorial 
from the London Society for Promoting Christianity Amongst the Jews, expressing in very strong and feeling language the deep sympathy of the members of the society um, with the Jews. So at the very highest level, CMJ was working with politicians and diplomats. Here's somebody that I think most of you will know about, and this is Alexander McCall, and he too played his part. It was because of this affair that he wrote um, his book, which is The Reasons for Believing that the Charge Lately revi reviled against the, Revived Against the Jewish People is a baseless falsehood, and it was a refutation of the blood libel. And with her permission, it was dedicated to none other than Queen Victoria herself. Queen Victoria took a personal interest in this affair. She hadn't been queen very long at all, but of course she was deeply influenced by Lord Palmerston, who himself must have been very interested in the affair, because as anybody who watched Victoria knows mm -hmm. <laughs> the series, she was very much influenced by Lord Palmerston. Questions were asked in Parliament by Sir Robert Peel, and Lord Palmerston himself actually responded and said that um, he, had, uh, in, he had instructed, already instructed, the British consul in Alexandria to bring the subject to the serious attention to the Pasha of Egypt and to point out to him the effects that it must have on the public mind in Europe. This is classic advocacy, ladies and gentlemen. This is classic speaking out on behalf of Jewish people. In the meantime, the Board of Deputies of British Jews had not been idle. They sent a delegation from the UK in the form of Moses and Lady Montefiore in July 1840. Um, the Queen received Moses and his wife before he left, which gave a royal seal of approval on this activity. But sadly, um, it, he, when he got to... Um, when he got to Egypt, to Alexandria, he didn't get anything like the response that um, Pirates had received in the presence of the British consul. Um, in the meantime, so this is uh, the 14th of August, the 14th of August, he wrote a very despondent letter saying that the Sultan had told him, essentially, Mehmet Ali had told him, essentially, that he hadn't got time for what was for helping in any way. Um, I've just mentioned these two here, Lord Palmerston and Metternich, Prince Metternich, the famous and great Austro-Hungarian diplomat in the 19th century, both of whom interceded on behalf of the Jewish people. I'm sure that the commentators in the first video were correct in saying that it wasn't entirely altruistic. There were ulterior motives because they wanted to extend their influence in the crumbling um, Ottoman Empire. Nevertheless, they still did it. The heart of man is in the hand of the Lord like drops of water. So, here is um, uh, Mehmet Ali Pasha of Egypt, the viceroy for the Ottomans. And he is not at, at, at all inclined on the 14th of August, 1840, to um, accede to Samosas Montefiore request that the Jews of Damascus who are in prison be, be released. However, I think some prayers might have been going up. Because on the 24th, uh, the 28th, 4th of August, Constantinople, um, in the form of the Sultan Abdul Mejid I, who was quite a, quite a guy, he's worth, worth knowing something about. I thought he was interested, interesting when I, saw, when I saw him. He issued two edicts or firmans, granting all of Sir Moses Montefiore's requests. Now, whilst he didn't exactly have the power to do it himself, because as I say, um, the, the Pasha of Egypt, um, Mehmet Ali Pasha, um, had, if, it had effectively booted the Ottomans out of those areas. Nevertheless, um, what the Sultan said, what the new Sultan said, um, 
had the backing of Great Britain and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And as they mentioned in the film, there'd been a bit of gunboat diplomacy going on against Egypt, and several of their ships had been sunk. <laughs> so, on the, the, uh, 12th, on, on the 24th of August, that arrived on the 28th of August, Mehmet Ali gave an instruction to his adopted son that he was to release the, um, the prisoners... And furthermore, the Sultan issued an edict that the blood libel was a lie and should never again be used against the Jews of the Ottoman Empire. Now, very sadly, his power was waning at that time, and it wasn't going to be the last time it was used. But nevertheless, that he did it was absolutely extraordinary, and undoubtedly, the people from CMJ, people like McCall, Shaftesbury, and of course... The Reverend George Wildham Peeritz played a huge part in that. So what was the significance? What were the significance and outcomes? Firstly, international cooperation in defence of Jews. The first time now the Jewish diaspora communities are coming together in defence of Jewish communities. It's the first example I can find of Christians and Jews meeting together to defend Jewish interests and persecuted Jews. The modern Jewish press was established in European and um, US, in, the, in Europe and in the US. For example, the Jewish Chronicle started in 1841, the year after the Damascus affair, undoubtedly as a result of it. And it's, um, it also meant the revival of blood libels in Europe and in, especially in the Arab countries, which, as the earlier film showed you, still lasts today. And it was the first example of a Christian organisation engaging in advocacy for Jews, and guess what? It was this one. So, what about now? Here's the Jobar synagogue, prior to destruction, and here it is now, sadly, after the Syrian civil war. Has the blood libel gone away? No, it hasn't. From a Liberal Democrat peer, although I think she's actually been thrown out of the Liberal Democrats now for this, um, Baroness Tong, asking Israelis to prove that they were not harvesting organs of children that they were helping during the Haiti earthquake rescue, oh yes, to um, this appalling, appalling cartoon that was published in The Independent in 2003. This is classic blood libel stuff. And what's even worse about it, folks, is that when Jewish organisations and the Israeli embassy lodged objections. It went to the press commission and the press commission said, oh no, it's not anti-Jew, it's only anti-Zionist. It's only anti-Israel. And furthermore, to add insult to injury, that year, this was awarded the political cartoon of the year, which just shows you the state of the... It would never do it now. It, this is one of the great things. This is what advocacy has done. There has been an improvement. That would now never be found in the independent, although there are some cartoonists who might try to do it. And um, sadly, it still goes on. The persecution of Jews simply for being Jews goes on. This shot was taken last week in Halle, in Germany, and this is a picture of some of the gunmen that tried to get into the synagogue. They only failed because Jews now have to take such measures of self-defence in Europe, in any of their institutions. Jews and Jews alone have to do this. The need for advocacy for Jewish people has never been greater. And the blood libels now are centred around the nation of Israel. CMJ 
was the first Christian organisation to engage in advocacy as we understand it today. It has a proud history. Let's continue it. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Fran, for that presentation. I thought that was excellent. It covers so much ground, and I know how much work would go into preparing that. Very, very thorough. I'm sure it stimulated a number of questions. Uh, we've got 10 minutes for a few questions. I'll repeat the questions for the, uh, anybody listening online, so you'll hear the question as well as uh, uh, give Fran a little few, bit more time to think of a good answer. <laughs> yeah. So are there any particular questions which, which came out from that very wonderful, uh, detailed, historical and practical presentation? I've got two questions, if I may, and then that gives them a question if anybody else has any. You talked about Father Thomas yes. being, a, being a monk. Do you know what religious order he was or where he, what church he belonged to at all? He was Italian and he was Catholic. Okay. And at the time, unfortunately, the Catholic church um, was going through uh, the, a period... The, which was known as the Ultramontane period, where the papacy was trying to establish um, its authority over the Catholic Church. And it was, it was very, very traditional. Um, it was a long way from the, um, the encyclicals which came out in the last century from the Roman Catholic Church about um, our elder, referring to the, church, to the Jews as our elder brothers. Um, and unfortunately, when asked to, do, to intervene... Um, to save the Jewish people who were being tortured and imprisoned, the Pope refused. Um, and my second question is just, again, a sort of factual question, which I, which I didn't know that the Jewish people in Damascus at that time were under Austrian protection. Why, why was that? Why was there a link with Austria having that oversight? I don't think they were at all okay. under Austrian protection. Right. But this particular Jewish person was, from what I understand it, a rich businessman who was involved oh, in trade with Austria and therefore um, had a relationship with Austria that Merlato, who was the um, Austrian consul, Giovanni Merlato, could use in order to intervene in his case. But he couldn't intervene in, in all the cases. Obviously, there were, at, at the time when um, Mehmet Ali ordered his adopted son, who was the um, Pasha, Sharif, uh, Pasha Sharif of Damascus, to release the Jews, there were still a no, uh, quite a number of them, quite a lot of them, in prison. Okay. Anybody else? Well, it's just a comment. The, uh, there was a violent argument, it said, between a, shock, a Muslim shopkeeper and the father and his servant just before they disappeared. So, did, I mean, didn't anyone follow that up, or was that just pushed into the carpet? Do we know? Yeah, I th it was brushed under the carpet, yes, that's exactly what happened. Um, in, the, in Damascus at that time, under the Ottoman Empire, uh, non-Muslims, which Christians and Jews, obviously, um, were the status of dhimis. They were people who had to pay the jizya, the, um, the, the tax, um, and so it far, it far better suited the, um, the Christian religious community to accuse the Jewish community than it did to take it to say to the, um, the community that essentially ruled the Ottoman Empire, um, it was you. It was much easier to say it was them. And we do thank you so much for, for your commitment to us and preparing that very, very thorough lecture. And we thank you. There'll be an opportunity to have coffee and, and, and tea afterwards. You've got any more questions on a one to one? I know Fran isn't going to be rushing away, so have a chance to, to talk to her. But can we just thank her once more for that presentation? <laughs> okay. Uh, having a smashing time. <laughs> That's right. Um, <clears throat> Just to say that we will be meeting next month then for uh, the lecture again, uh, which uh, should, be, should be really good on uh, understanding the use of manna bread in, in, in that 
uh, in the Exodus story, which will be, be really interesting. And again, please take a look at any of the free literature. And uh, if you want to have a chat after it's over, you've got to rush away. Um, and please stay and have some, some more drinks and coffee. So hope to see you next month again. I thought that was a really good lecture. I, my only time my mind wandered was when I was thinking of Muhammad Ali, and I got yeah. a, little, a little bit confused yeah. there. Yeah. If, but that, apart from that, <laughs> but apart from that, I was with you 100 percent of the time. Thank you so much. People have been praying 24-7, called like prayer wall around the city. And one woman who I had no idea about Jewish stuff or anything was praying and she felt God was saying that there was a, like a root of, um, rot, a rotten root of evil in the city. And it was something to do with Jewish people and she had no idea at all. So she went to my sister Suki, a lot of you know, and mentioned it to her and Suki said, well, as far as I'm aware, the Lord's people, yes, we believe us, but in the scripture it's Jewish people. So anyway, they did some digging in the, the area where the woman had been prayer walking, and it turned out there had been a very big, strong Jewish community back in 1270 or something like that. Kept on digging and discovered that that was, um, that uh, the Jewish people had been hounded out of the city by Simon de Montfort. 1231. 1231, so. Oh. And, had, and so <coughs> they felt that the Lord had brought this to light for a particular purpose, particularly for a woman who had no idea about any of that stuff. She was a newish Christian. And so they um, they did some digging, because Simon de Montfort is well known in Leicester, you know, and mm. his statues on the clock tower, and the Montfort, the university, this is the Montfort. Castle in Israel actually named after him. So, but um, and so he is well known because he, him and his father founded modern ways of you know the parliament and all the rest of it. But uh, incredibly anti-Semitic. So, um, so they did some digging, a bit more digging. They did lots of digging and discovered that it was still a statute on Leicester.